Thank you very much, Lee, uh, and uh, thank you to uh, the Korean organizers for arranging this uh, very interesting uh, workshop and uh, the network. So I'm going to speak a little bit about antivirus epidemiology, maybe, uh, rather than control. I'm from the University of Malaya, uh, rather than the Ministry of Health, so I, I look at things more from the research point of view. Um, I'm here also on behalf of uh, Dr. Chandra Khan, who is supposed to be the main uh, investigator for our institution, but unfortunately, she couldn't be there. So I'm going to talk mainly about um, uh, West Malaysia, which is here, and uh, Dr. David Ferreira will talk about East Malaysia um, in the next talk. So just to start off with, uh, antivirus uh, surveillance. We, in Malaysia, we've been doing a acute mass paralysis uh, surveillance since 1992, and that was also the year that wild-type polio was last isolated. Um, but since then, there's been, of course, great interest in non-polio antiviruses, um, particularly as we have fatal outbreaks of antivirus 21 um, reported in three, three yearly cycles in 97, uh, 2000, 2003, 2006, 89, and 2012. However, it's only in 2006 that HFMD itself became a notifiable disease, and only the following year um, when guidelines were issued by the Ministry of Health. Now, generally, um, even though we've had um, EV71 in Malaysia for some time, um, the laboratory diagnosis is still quite limited. Um, there are a few labs who can do culture and, and do PCR, uh, and the central public health laboratory tends to investigate only really for outbreaks rather than um, uh, surveillance, at least in the peninsula of Malaysia. Okay, um, um, these are. Said, um, these are actually this is my son. So my son had antivirus when he was about four, but he was fine. <laughs> um, so just a brief thing about the Ministry of Health guidelines, in, which were issued in 2007, and I'll just highlight some of the salient points. Um, cases are investigated if uh, they are um, hospitalized or died or um, in preschool, or if it's confirmed in the laboratory as antivirus 71, um, or if there are more than two cases. I think I can do this, it's easier. Okay, um, so some of the actions that are uh, carried out is uh, uh, cases that are excluded for 10 days, um, active case detection in the institution, uh, or and as well in the family, and the supervisors and teachers of that institution are also educated to teach the kids, if possible, how to be uh, hygienic, um, and also to disinfect in the environment and so on. Um, and if there's more than two cases in the nursery, um, that's shut for 10 days. So this is uh, some of the data which the Ministry of Health has kindly shared with us. Um, it's, it's not actually publicly available, but uh, we, we collaborate with them to, to bring this uh, particularly to the um, notice of local Malaysians. Um, and what you can see here is um, two things. So this is um, HFMD notifications um, over time. Uh, and note that, uh, as I mentioned before, we don't have a lot of laboratory diagnosis, so, so viral etiology is, is not really, it's, it's somewhat lacking. Um, you can notice a couple of things from here. First of all, um, I mentioned that we had three yearly outbreaks. Um, you can see the tail end on that. It starts in 2008 because notification starts in 2006. So we can have the, um, the tail end of the 2008-09 outbreak and the 2012 outbreak. But since then, we really had um, annual outbreaks um, in both, at least up to 2015. So this appears to have been a slight change uh, from that point of view. Um, you can also note here that um, there appears to be a seasonal element in it. I think some of the others here have shared that as well. Um, and perhaps a peak around the middle of the year for each of these outbreaks as well, so around May to June. So we were interested in looking at why in the past Malaysia had three, three yearly outbreaks. And of course there are many possible reasons for this. It could be the genotype change, it could be population immunity uh, and so on. But we were particularly interested in asking whether population immunity, uh, which we can use seroprevalence as a proxy for could explain these cycles. So what we did was we tested uh, 2,000 serum samples collected from our hospital patients, uh, from children between 95 and 2012. So this is spanning 18 years and um, six reported antivirus 71 outbreaks. And we did a micronutrialization assay uh, using the B4 virus. And, and here are some of the results. So in this, in this um, particular graph, you can see that uh, these are the age groups along the x-axis and the seropositive rate along the y-axis. And a couple of things that you can see, 
Um, first of all, um, oh, sorry, the black bars are epidemic years and the white bars are not epidemic years. And as a, as a general sort of um, trend that uh, zero prevalence um, is low in children, uh, in younger children, and then it goes up, um, and uh, therefore younger children are more susceptible to ED71. Um, and also during epidemic years, not surprisingly, the zero prevalence is higher than, than non-epidemic years. Of interest as well, we, we also looked at uh, a few samples which are um, analyzed separately from these because um, these are children less than the age of one year, so they should have a sentinel antibody. Uh, and what you can see here is for the six month age group and those who are six to 12 months, these are the um, non epidemic year zero prevalence um, and the epidemic year zero prevalence here. So it also goes up in keeping with all the others. What's interesting to note here is that despite the fact that um, there is some maternal um, antibodies, um, quite a lot of children. I mean, there seems to be a population zero conversion which fits with the fact that these children are also at, at risk of enterovirus as one. So this is impactful vaccine programs, for example, because we really might have to start having to think about vaccinating children even younger than six months. Okay, so that data fits in with um, uh, each specific incidence of HFMD, which um, the data for this, again, from the Ministry of Health, is only available from about 2011 onwards. But this as well um, confirms uh, what others have found that uh, um, as you, the younger you are, the higher you are at risk of HFMD. Um, and it appears to be mainly those under the age of three who get it. So that fits in with the previous graph, which shows that there's high susceptibility, low zero prevalence in, in the very young, and uh, high incidence as a result. Okay, now in this particular graph, we've laid out all the zero prevalence that we measured. Um, over, over the 18 years. Um, and there's two bars here. The, um, the grey bars are the, the children who are preschool, one to six years. And the white bars are the children who are seven to 12 years. Uh, and the other things to note are that these arrows indicate the years where we reported E71 outbreaks. Um, and you can see from here that um, there is a trend uh, where <coughs> zero prevalence is high. Um, in, in the years where there are reported epidemics, and then it drops in the years where there are no epidemics. Okay. The other thing to note as well, which is, um, again, I guess it, it supports uh, what uh, Dr. Wiesner found, is that uh, prior to the first reported enterovirus um, in, in 1997, we did have zero prevalence of the 71 at least measured by um, our technique of micro-initialization. So this trend suggests that um, EVA71 zero prevalence um, drops during non-epidemic years and goes up during epidemic years. Okay, and we, we wanted to um, see if there was, this was statistically significant and with the help of our statisticians, um, we looked at uh, some factors which could be associated with um, cyclical patterns of epidemics. Um, and the, these three are of note. So the first one at the top there, 10% decrease in zero prevalence uh, between preceding and current months. So what this means is that um, if zero prevalence in the current year is lower than the previous year, then there's a higher odds of an, an, an outbreak of ED71 taking place, and that's a significantly um, a significant association. So that confirms one of our initial hypotheses that population immunity um, is linked. So as population immunity falls, um, the risk of an epidemic goes up. We also found um, some links with a uh, lower temperature and um, lower number of rain days as part of our analysis of climatic factors. But we, 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 would, we certainly need to do more work with this because this data represents the whole of Malaysia and there will be subtle differences between um, different states. But the key takeaway for us was that uh, finding that, uh, that trend that we saw in the, in the previous graph um, is statistically supported. Okay, so, so we have associated population immunity drops with um, epidemics. Um, so what about uh, other things such as genotype changes? And indeed, um, this is a phylogenetic tree of, um, of Malaysian isolates, oh, sorry, Malaysian sequences that are available in, um, in GenMac. Uh, some of them are from us and um, from uh, other parts of Malaysia. And this is a, a genetic diversity <coughs> um, figure as well. And what this basically shows is that um, in, as each outbreak happened, uh, there were different uh, genotypes. So for example, in 1997 here, 
we had a C2, C1, um, B3, and B4. And in 2000, we had um, C1, which is the pink here, and B4. And in 2003, uh, we had C1 here and B5. Okay, so because this is a this is a time axis, but after 2000, 2005, 2006, we we only really had B5. Um, and the relative um, genetic diversity graph shows that um, these peaks of genetic diversity coincide with these genotype shifts. Um, and even in the years when we only had B5, there has still been small small um, spikes in genetic diversity during the, the outbreak years. So this suggests that uh, our outbreak years are associated with either change in genotype or a further evol evolution of an existing genotype. Of course, HFMD outbreaks are also driven by different, multi, uh, different antivirus stereotypes. And here again, we, we're at a slight disadvantage because we don't have really strong uh, huge amounts of um, detailed virological um, etiological agent data. Uh, so, so this is drawn, for example, from two separate studies, one in our center and one in another center at Salamo, which, which only looked at 37 um, isolates or sequences. And, uh, and very much in keeping with what was found in other parts of the world, we found um, the virus A6 uh, was increased around that time, um, but EV71 was, was also co-circulating. And um, a small uh, contribution from uh, the virus A16. So this, this may explain why in the last few years we've had annual outbreaks, because this is what we're seeing in Singapore, for example. Singapore often, what happens there kind of mirrors what happens in, in, in Malaysia. And, and uh, there's a paper which I haven't shown here, but they also show a similar thing where they, they had three yearly outbreaks, but in the last sort of few years, since 2012, we've had annual outbreaks, driven mainly by A6 and E71. So it's possible that something like this may explain why we've suddenly had a slight change in our, in our epidemiology. Okay, we, we also looked at uh, some rural populations. So we have a, a, a large uh, population of indigenous people. Um, and in, a, in another study that we did, we looked at zero prevalence of EB71 um, to see whether there was any differences in the urban population in KL and in the rural population, uh, as shown here. And this is because of um, several studies, including uh, from Taiwan and China, which suggest that uh, EV71 is, um, is higher, or at least certainly severe cases are higher um, than those from rural populations. And what we found here, um, so the zero positive rates of the urban children are in black and uh, rural children are in white, um, is that there was a, a huge, quite a big difference. Um, the, the rural children were much, much more likely to be zero positive than the urban children. 96% um, versus 58% in total, but you can see that rather large differences um, in each age group up to the age of 12, and after that, uh, more or less the same. In terms of demographic risk factors, one of the, or the, the main predictor of seropositivity in, in rural children was the use of um, untreated water, so not piped water, but uh, river water, well water, and so on. Uh, and that would fit in with, with um, exposure to uh, fecal oral patient, uh, fecal oral pathogens, um, because a lot of these rural children also are at higher risk of, of parasites and, and uh, other other fecal orally transmitted pathogens. Okay, so just to conclude, um, in Malaysia, uh, we see, um, or we did see, cyclical three-year enterovirus seventy-one outbreaks, um, and we find that uh, we speculate that um, this, this could support that. Uh, this is driven by um, changes in population immunity. So uh, after an outbreak, you have fairly high immunity, uh, and then uh, it takes another three years of births and so on to, to generate a new population of uh, susceptible children, sufficient enough that an outbreak um, can happen, transmission can happen subsequently. There is also a link with virogenetic diversity uh, occurring uh, at, at each outbreak. Um, but we, as, as noted previously, we, we can't really put a link to this because in, certainly in some of the, the laboratory what we've done and, and others have done, there does appear to be quite good cross-protection um, of antibodies from one genotype to another. So, so whether the, the genetic diversity is just a result of population immunity and, and so on rather than a cause of new, new outbreaks is, is open to question. 
each of the outbreaks are of course also driven by other natural viruses and they, that may actually cause outbreaks um, more frequently. Um, demographic factors, possibly climate. Um, and the knowledge gaps that we have in Malaysia, which um, uh, we, we hope that this, um, being part of this network will help us to, to look into, particularly to look at the causative viral agents, um, and then also to explore things like seasonality, whether, whether climate is a factor and so on. Um, and also, uh, who are the populations at risk? Uh, I think we spoke about that um, in the last couple of talks, but uh, that kind of data is not really known in Malaysia at the moment. So all of this information will be useful for future planning and, and timing and target populations of vaccine programs. Do we need to target those under the age of six months, as suggested by um, our data? Um, do we need to focus as well on rural patients, uh, rural children, even though you know, we, we logically, or most people have a conception that um, these outbreaks are mainly found in, in childcare centers, which are found in urban centers. Uh, so those are the things which need to be addressed from Asia. Uh, that, uh, to just acknowledge uh, my two students, uh, Nadia and Kamne, who did most of this work, uh, funding sources from UM and um, other ministries, and uh, some of our collaborators in UM and Ministry of Health for uh, a really good work that we've done together. Thank you again to everyone for your attention. Thank you.